Hello, the University of Dundee and the International Bar Association welcome you to this webinar on the law and governance of mining and minerals, a global perspective. This is hosted by the Extractives Hub of the Center for Energy, Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy of the, of the University of Dundee and the Section of Energy, Environment, Natural Resources and Infrastructure Law of the IBA. We'll have to start opening remarks from Professor Peter Cameron. Professor Cameron is one of the world's leading authorities on energy law. He's a professor of international law, um, international energy law, and he's a director of the Center of Energy, Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy at Dundee. And uh, without any further delay, I would welcome Professor Cameron and hand him the microphone if you, if you can. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you. Uh... And good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if it's good afternoon, but depending on where you are on the globe, because we have a very international group of, uh, of people joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm Peter Cameron. I'm the director of the Center for Energy, uh, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy at the University of Dundee. Uh, we've uh, we're consistently uh, done, uh, rated us, been rated very highly for the work we've done in law and economics um, internationally, and uh, we're one of the top 10 centers of, of, of its kind uh, in the world, and we're very happy about that. But we're also very lucky because we've been able to get uh, some grants from the UK government, and uh, they've allowed us to develop an extractives hub project, and it's that project that has functioned as the bridge for a really interesting collaboration <clears throat> that we've started with the International Bar Association, uh, with Manuel and uh, Carlos and his colleagues, and we're delighted that it's going forward today um, in a way that will allow us to, to share with you um, the, some of the research that we've been doing, not actually in the Hub project itself, but in the rest of the CPMLP. We have obviously a fair number of academic uh, professors who, who do research, and, and one of them uh, is, uh, is Dr. Elizabeth Bastida, who's, uh, who's originally from, from Argentina. Uh, we've got quite an international staff, and we're, we're, uh, Elizabeth's been with us for, for some time, and she's been working on a, on a book which happily only is finished published and it's being launched. So this is something that we thought we would do uh, and share some of the insights uh, in that book with you today. So Elizabeth's going to be able to do that. And uh, who better really to, to, uh, to help us do this but the International Bar Association and also the, the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Association, or foundation I should say, which is, uh, which is also a part of this project today. Uh, so, Manuel, with those introductory remarks, I just want to say I'm, I'm so happy about, about all of this and uh, excited to, to, to hear Elizabeth. And uh, absolutely delighted that we've got to this point because getting a book finished is a big job. Uh, so it, it, it takes years of work, so it's really great that Elizabeth got, got this far. Uh, so well done, Elizabeth, and, um, and good luck for the future. Manuel. Thank you very much, Professor Cameron. Um, so we'll have The Law and Governance of Mining and Minerals, A Global Perspective, a book by Ana Elizabeth Bastida. Ana Elizabeth Bastida, um, from Argentina, as Peter was saying, is a senior lecturer at the Center for Energy, Petroleum, and Mineral Law and Policy here at Dundee. Uh, and she's an officer of the Mining Law Committee, as well as a trustee at large of the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation. Elizabeth's books, as mentioned, is being published today, and it will be the center around which uh, all other interventions in the webinar will, will orbit to a certain extent. We are in fact taking the opportunity triggered by this book to discuss governance and related matters in the wider scope of the extracting industries. As we all know, the traditional extracting industries, mining, uh, oil, uh, are typically seen as somewhat averse to the sustainability agenda and the various, uh, some of the various ideas that surround the sustainability agenda. And so, it, and so it is a good opportunity to discuss all of that in the context and in the, in the, in the, in the framework given by Elizabeth's book. 
the industries themselves, and this is a, a way to introduce the, for the, the following speakers or the, the speakers that will talk after Elizabeth, the industries themselves are seen uh, in a somewhat different manner. I mean, uh, mining is typically seen as an industry instrumental to achieve decarbonization and energy transition, while at the same time, oil and gas is normally considered to have a less bright future, to say the least. We're going to discuss part of this or all of this uh, from the various different perspectives. Uh, after the presentation of Elizabeth's book, we'll have Anka Mielescu from Romania. Anka is a former of Idelie Mielescu law firm. She's among one of the most experienced Romanian lawyers in M&A and energy with contributions that go above the traditional transactional practice and extend to the drafting of regulation uh, for the sector and laws for the sector. She's an officer of the Oil and Gas Committee of the, IMA, of the IBA and will give us some perspectives from that in industry probably. We will then, after Anka, we will have comments from the sustainability lenses of Jonathan Crocker, the partner of BLG in Toronto, Canada. Jonathan is the first sustainability officer at the IBA. He's an environmental law specialist with major contributions in the increasingly important area of the circular economy, particularly with the World Business Council. And Jonathan is also an officer of the Environmental Health and Safety Law Committee of the IBA. A final, probably more telescopic set of comments will be provided by Professor Volker Hoven, uh, Professor of Energy Law at Dundee and International Law and Global Regulation also at the University of Dundee. Professor Hoven is further to his uh, ongoings in Dundee. He's a visiting professor at the China University of Political Science and Law in Beijing at the University of Turku and an adjunct professor at the University of, of Houston. Um, after our speakers, so after Elizabeth, Anka, Jonathan and Professor Robin, we'd like to save about 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, and I would welcome you to use the chat platform in the Zoom environment to write down your questions so that we can have a look at them and then direct them at the panel. Closing remarks will finally be provided by Carlos Villena. Carlos is a partner from the Pinheiro Neto Law Firm in Brazil, where he heads the firm's mining and government relation practices. He's the co-chair of the IBA Mining Law Committee. He's a director of the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation, Professor Cameron has talked about earlier on, and he is a former LM alumnus from the University of Dundee. Well, that's the plan. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> Elizabeth, the stage is yeah. yours. I will let you know when we get to uh -huh. two minutes away from 15. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Manuel, for the introduction. I am delighted to get to this stage of the publication process and to, to be able to share with you and with this distinguished panel uh, the argument of my book and some of the findings. And I believe that that is uh, the, the right setting because the book, the ultimate aim of the book is very much about um, contributing uh, with a framework to uh, for, for uh, generating a conversation about, uh, the, about the long governance of mine and minerals as an academic discipline. So the starting, let me tell you about the starting point of the book. Um, the traditional, the, tra the starting point is the observation uh, about the, the traditional focus of mining law as a matter of national regulation. So the traditional focus of the study of mining law has mostly been confined to domestic legal systems. So I would say that it has not yet broadened systematically to encompass the various levels of normative orderings of social relations concerning mining and minerals at international, transnational, regional, national, and local levels. And, uh, and that has not yet been reflected, has not been reflected the, uh, the diversity of sources that constitute the law and governance of mining and minerals. So both the law and the framings are characterized, I believe, by great fragmentation, a, high, a great degree of fra fragmentation, and are usually focused on extraction. So 
I would say that unlike energy law, that actually has been the subject of academic inquiry and has shifted from its, uh, its uh, domestic law focus or locus to the field of uh, international and transnational studies, I believe that we need framings uh, for the study of the law, of the mining law uh, um, uh, and regulation from a perspective that cuts through that great fragmentation and complexity and that captures the global nature of mining and minerals. So uh, mining and minerals are at the center of an industry that is global by nature, that it is global because of the, the, the nature of the market, the, the players, because of uh, minerals are inputs uh, um, for components in many products that are fabricated, traded, and used in the global economy. But the minerals are also at the center uh, of, the, of, core, of the core challenges of our age, minerals and mining. Minerals are hailed uh, as part of the solution to build the infra infrastructure uh, required to deal with climate change. As uh, the UN Secretary General uh, says, the most systemic threat to humankind and also they are components of technological innovation and, in, and mining, if managed well, can contribute to broader based development and poverty eradication. But on the contrary, increased levels of extraction at ever lower uh, grades uh, threat to compound the problem of, of loss ecosystem, of ecosystems um, inequity in allocation of resources and disruption of local communities. So minerals are, are mining, as I said, are at the center of uh, an industry that is global by nature and of the core global challenges of our age. So um, the aim of the book uh, is to explore a disciplinary, a disciplinary matrix from a global perspective for the study, for the understanding of this great complexity of the law and governance concerning mining and minerals, taking account of the key challenges of Agenda 2030 and the transition to low carbon economies and the circular economy. So the, per the perspective I hopefully captures that multifaceted and highly complex interaction of multiple fields of international land policy, soft law standards, uh, domestic law and regulations, and social levels, uh, on local levels of social ordering of uh, uh, relations. So what the book, uh, the book calls for adopting a global perspective to the study of the law and governance of mining mineral and minerals as an academic discipline and makes two closely connected claims. Uh, the first one is that, uh, the first one advances that a global perspective will further our understanding of the breadth and the interdependence of the various levels of normative ordering of social relations concerning mining and minerals. And the second one, the second claim, a posits that a global perspective implies engaging with sustainable development and sustainability as an objective of the global community and also as a conceptual matrix as characterized by scholarship for integrating environmental sustainability and social and economic equity into decisions about economic projects at all levels. So the first chapter, the, as a sort of the, the, the in, in the first chapter, uh, I cite at the start a quote from Professor Twining defining a global perspective. Um, I believe that Twining challenges lawyers to shaping overarching visions of cosmopolitan uh, disciplines of law in ways that grasp both complex and diverse legal phenomena and engage with the core challenges of our age and the implications for our disciplines. So let me share with you like the main findings of, of the book and then I will go through 
the table of contents to show you the structure, how I build the, the argument. So uh, what, what emerges basically from this exploration of uh, levels of normative ordering of mining and minerals is increasing, although fragmented, highly fragmented law and regulation uh, of the field. I believe that this has been a neglected uh, area of inquiry in international scholarship, chronically under systematized and under theorized. And um, I believe that a disciplinary matrix uh, of the law and governance for mining in minerals is embedded in the understanding of the geographical levels of relations and legal ordering concerning mining and minerals, uh, minerals access and management and the diversity of sources, and of the various fields of law and regulation concerning sustainable resource management, which often conflict, uh, overlap, and interpenetrate each other. So basically, uh, what the book uh, uh, finds is that, or, or suggests, it is that uh, this is a largely, uh, that it is that that this discipline lies at the intersection of the global economy, environmental sustainability, human rights, and social equity, and then identify challenges for building the discipline and uh, engaging in conversation with various communities of practice and, and stakeholders is very much at uh, the heart of the making of the discipline and, and the challenge. So, and in terms of the, the research agenda, one of the issues in the research agenda, and I believe that is going to be part, a major aspect of the evolution of this area of law, is the need to, to research on framings, on uh, reusing and recycling minerals. I'm sure that that will be a major aspect of the law and governance of mining and minerals. And that's why I, made, I put a lot of focus on not just looking at mining, but from a global perspective, it's, we, need to, we need to look at the global, the whole value, global, uh, the whole global value chain, and, and sort of to look at uh, and, and to get a sense of how this is going to evolve. So if we have, a, hopefully, a second edition of the book, that should be very much a chapter in the book, the reuse, sort of the regulation on the reuse and recycling of uh, minerals. So uh, this is, as I say, very much a subject of conversation. So this is the right setting to do, to start this. And uh, so I just wanted to share with you uh, the editorial house provided me with a discount, a book discount, um, so that I will, I will uh, share with, uh, with the attendants. And then just to finalize, I wanted uh, to, to show you the, um, if we have time, the table of contents of the book. So the book is uh, structured into uh, seven chapters. Um, the first one it lays out the argument um, and, and reviews the literature. Um, the second chapter uh, reviews, looks at the actors and governance uh, from a global perspective. The third chapter, um, the third chapter reviews the key constituent elements of uh, mining and minerals from an international, an in, in international one policy, reviews the concept of sustainable development and the legal underpinnings and evolution of the concept and the understanding of mining and minerals in it. The fourth chapter look at mining as, looks at mining and minerals in fields of international law and governance. So in um, international economic law, human rights law, anti-corruption instruments and transnational standards. The fifth chapter looks at mining and mineral regimes in the global commons. Uh, the sixth chapter of uh, mining law regimes at the level of nation states and their in interface with local levels. It is, this chapter is, of course, very schematic and looks at uh, basically mineral tenure regimes and the interface with uh, uh, different aspects of regulation. And the seventh chapter um, concludes uh, with an overarching vision and sets the conclusions and a research agenda. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity to present in this, in, 
to this audience. Brilliant, Elizabeth. Thank you very much from us all and uh, from the moderator perspective, right on time and still saving some time. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd, I'd uh, hand over the mic to Anka Mielesko from the Oil and Gas Committee of the IBA. Okay. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, and uh, congratulations, uh, Elizabeth. It, it sounds like a very interesting book. I will definitely buy it and read it. Um, I have uh, some uh, ideas. Uh, one, considering the fact that I am a Romanian lawyer and uh, Romania has a serious mining industry. Uh, Romania has, uh, we, we do mining since, two, since 2000 years, since the Romans time, so we have a lot of history and a lot of stories to tell. Uh, and second, from the perspective of the European Union, which is, um, I think it's a good starting point. Uh, if we talk about uh, globalization of the law and trying to find uh, an international uh, regulatory framework for the, for the mining industry. Uh, as a personal opinion, uh, and also considering what I know from, uh, from, uh, from the industry, uh, it is definitely a good idea and it is needed to have an international cover of the, of the mining field, but in the same time, we need to to understand that every geographic area has some particularities. Uh, it's the same as with the same issue with globalization, uh, universality versus uh, cultural relativity. It's the same here. If we take, uh, for, let's say, pollution of the land as a factor, the land is polluted in, in some way, in some parts of the, of the planet and in different ways in other parts. There are different fa factors such as groundwater that need to be considered. So any such international regula uh, regulatory framework needs to take into consideration the particularities of, uh, of each country or, or of each region. Uh, now in terms of, of European Union, uh, we have... Uh, I don't know if uh, definitely maybe not enough legislation, probably there is still need for some, uh, but we have a good uh, European framework that is that uh, all the European countries, the, the, the countries that are part of the European Union needs to, to obey. Uh, we have directives uh, regarding uh, environmental impact assessment, environmental liability, uh, protection of habitats of, of birds, and we also have a, a directive regarding um, waste from mining act, uh, activities. Uh, we also have some uh, directives which, which regulate for the manner in which a mining license is actually granted. So we are pretty much covered, I think, although there is always a need for more. Uh, it is good to, to note that uh, we also have, um, uh, there is a new regulation uh, which is uh, regarding conflict mineral. So there are certain minerals, and I have here a, a list, uh, tin, tungsten, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, tantalum and gold, uh, which, are, um, which are considered high-risk high minerals. Uh, and there is a, uh, there, there is a regulation, uh, a new one at the level of the European Union. I understand that something similar exists also in the United States, which are meant to make sure that when we get this mineral from parts of the world which are not so safe, we do some due diligence. We do some due diligence in order to make sure that we don't take the mineral from parties that uh, probably we do not want to do business with. Uh, I, when I read about this uh, regulation, I, I thought it, uh, it, it was uh, necessary. Um, we also have a list of critical minerals, uh, minerals uh, that uh, the European Union needs. And uh, we, we need to make sure that we are not going to run uh, without. So I think that any study about international regulation can, uh, can start with the European Union. Um, now, in terms, in, in, in terms of my country, uh, I think I have a very good example about uh, what uh, uh, an international, in this sense, an, an European framework uh, can mean. Uh, we joined the European Union in 2007, 
And uh, because of all the environmental uh, framework uh, at the level of the European Union that I have just told you about, uh, a lot of the mines that were uh, in that moment um, uh, open for business in, in, in Romania uh, weren't uh, able to, to, to meet all the requirements. So they closed them, starting with 1st of January 2007. Uh, the majority of the former state-owned mines, uh, they were called, but they, they were closed. Uh, there are good things and well, also some bad, some bad things about it. Uh, so all of the mines were closed here because of the European uh, uh, directive. It was very good because the, these mines were very old and they were, uh, they were not, uh, from an environmental perspective, uh, they, were, they weren't working. Uh, now, 13 years later, uh, the majority of them are still closed because uh, a lot of investments were necessary to reopen them and uh, the industry was neglected by the, by the Romanian government. Uh, currently, Romania has uh, resources, especially uh, copper, gold, silver. And now, uh, a couple of days ago, a new law was enacted uh, providing for the opening of these old mines. So we are, uh, we are waiting to see if the mining industry will be somehow brought back to life because we have a huge potential. Um, I think these were my, the, the main comments. Manuel, did, do I have more time? Or? I guess you have another 30 seconds or so. so. <laughs> I have another 30 seconds. So uh, do I need to say something in this? Uh, I can say again that uh, I think that Elizabeth's book, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very good and uh, we all need to, to read it and have an idea and try to, to well, I, I think I can say one more, one more thing. Uh, minerals are really necessary in terms of sustainable development and a circular economy. Uh, this is the future. If we want to live in a better world, we need this. And we, don't, we cannot do it without minerals. So I think that uh, Elizabeth book is a very good starting point and that all of us need to start to think about this and uh, well, encourage the, the government, the organization that we are part of to, to make a framework that, uh, that works and that helps the industry. Thank you, Anka. Thank you very much. Sorry about being the whip and uh, with, uh, with the time, but we need to keep this um, uh, tight ship. <laughs> Jonathan, can I? Uh, Jonathan, as I mentioned, is, uh, is an officer of the Environmental Health and Safety Law Committee of the IBA, and I would hand him the microphone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and, and uh, congratulations, Elizabeth. Uh, I echo Anka's uh, comments about the, the fabulous new book and the, uh, the, the dynamic ideas that, that come from it. And, and I, uh, when I heard Anka say that minerals are uh, relevant in terms of uh, recovery and uh, circular economy, um, it, it, you know, it, it caused me to think about uh, my, own, my own industries, which are resource recovery industries, and, and how they operate. And, and I think there may be some interesting parallels and maybe even a few lessons from uh, curiously, from the end-of-life markets in respect of the extractive industries. So if, if you recall uh, the circular economy markets out there, and, and, and uh, you know, we look to Europe first, of course, in the, um, in the creation of these markets, they tend to be about 25 years old at most. And so as a result of that, I think we, we saw a perspective uh, in creating those markets that was very different than uh, when the extractive industries first started uh, at the beginning of time. And so what I think was brought to the, rig the resource recovery markets were, were concerns around uh, effectively uh, an interplay of three different, three different interests. The first is the strict regulatory interest, the, the, the narrow interests I think, Elizabeth, you talked about earlier uh, in your presentation. 
Second, we have the commercial interests. So there needs to be markets around uh, the resource recovery industries. So they need to be vibrant commercial markets. And, and the third is the soft law that Elizabeth, I also heard you mention, and that's around the goals of these markets. So in addition to succeeding commercially, there's also a need for these markets to achieve certain ends. And one of those ends, for example, is a more circular economy, uh, less environmental impact, uh, more reuse of materials, uh, and innovation. And, and when we saw these markets start uh, in the European Union and elsewhere, we saw that some of that innovation was lacking. And I think we saw that because the, the regulatory regimes were too narrow. They simply said, thou shalt pay a, a fee and someone shall recover and recycle the materials you've placed onto the market. And, and so what we, what we didn't see is a dynamism around new design, new use of different materials, innovation, new collaborations. And so we've kind of stepped back, I think, in resource recovery markets and said, how do we really engender real innovation? And that, again, is an interplay between those three different pillars I just mentioned. And, and then I think the other thing, Elizabeth, that I, I heard you talk about that I thought was fabulous was the interplay between international, regional, and, and domestic. So a, a lot of these markets start as domestic initiatives. But of course, on the domestic level, there are limitations in, in respect of efficacy. So if you think of a, a circular economy standard that says a, an electronic device shall have certain characteristics in our marketplace in order to sell in our marketplace, most countries don't have the ability to enforce that because their markets are too small. Their influence internationally is too insignificant. So th there's a push uh, to, to switch to the, to the other extreme and say, we shall internationalize everything. We'll have a single set of rules internationally. And I, I heard Anka say this, and I think this is absolutely right. That in my mind uh, in 2020 is a mistake because we don't have the same circumstances, we don't have the same environments, we don't have the same commercial and social settings across the globe, and never in my mind has a single strategy that includes uh, social, environmental, commercial, institutional policy, never has a single strategy worked across the globe. And I can't imagine it'll work in 2020 as it didn't work in uh, 1820. So, so instead, I think we start to look at at what might be the entry points, the sweet spots in terms of how these resource recovery markets might work. And one of those areas, and I think, Ank, I heard you say this as well, one of those areas is around regionalism. To say, okay, we, we come from different countries, and this panel is, of course, a wonderful example of the, of the different uh, global interests in this space. But we might say there's some sweet spots around regionalism. In other words, countries that share the same socioeconomic interests, maybe the same climatological circumstances, maybe there we'll find some, some, some interesting incubations around a policy and a strategy that works, as we said earlier, regulatory, commercial, and, and, and social interests. Maybe we'll find some interesting entry points. And, and maybe there are some places there where we can see models in the resource recovery market that might also work in the extractive market. In other words, satisfying those different interplays uh, not being too simplistic as to which, which entry point and which exit point is right vis-a-vis -vis the regulatory uh, authority, but rather having a global perspective on what's needed internationally and how, that, and, and how locally those things can be implemented with, enough, uh, ro an, uh, with a robust strategy that makes them real. Because the mistake, of course, is to, is to focus on one set of one jurisdiction uh, in the absence of another, whether that's regional uh, state, uh, multilateral, or global. So, so I think there's some real interesting things happening in resource recovery that make sense for resources, for the resource strategy industry. And with that, with that, Manuel, I'll, I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And right on time, <laughs> as expected. <laughs> and uh, I would ask Professor Hoban to take on the lead right now. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Manuel, and uh, the other speakers. Um, I'm extremely uh, honoured and um, and proud, really, to be able um, to join this panel, distinguished. And um, as you know, um, 
with uh, Peter Cameron. Um, I am the uh, general editor of the series in which uh, Anna's book has now um, been published as the first, uh, <laughs> The Trail Blazer. And uh, it's, it's doing this um, in, an, in an absolutely fantastic way, I think. It does uh, give meaning to the approach that, that Peter and I were uh, advocating uh, to the publisher that in energy and, and mineral, um, we can no longer take a uh, simply national perspective, but need to have an international one to understand and a global one to understand these changes. And also, uh, and that's the second point, uh, one that does um, combine a theory and a cutting edge theory, uh, like the one that um, uh, Anna mentioned, with a keen sense of the reality of law, um, because that makes us different uh, from uh, from politicians or, or philosophers that we actually work uh, with the positive law. And um, it, so it's, it's theoretically informed, but uh, practically relevant um, what is going on. And I think Anna's book does show this. What a powerful... Um, the combination this can be to actually explain and to shed new lights on things we probably all see all the time in this fast changing area uh, and uh, i think that's really what this book does and uh, what others will uh, will do is to give orientation in in what is probably the change the, one of the fastest changing areas um uh, of uh, of law uh, and that's true globally uh, and uh, everything that has been said by the previous speakers um and by maria and jonathan is is so true and i can only um underscore this and I think there's only one point um, I would like to add, and that is probably that uh, this is this is both uh, and the energy transition and the mineral uh, that play such a critical role in it are entirely strategic. Uh, this is about change. Uh, it is about change towards an objective that the international community has set itself um, to meet this critical. Uh, critical uh, threat really to uh, to our survival and that change is in my perspective certainly from international law perspective the first time that we actually want uh, we want to use uh, governance and international law to bring about meaningful change to arrive at an objective uh, uh, that that is in the future it's time sensitive but lies in the future and in part as part of this we actually see more and more of these if I lack a better word, circular lawmaking processes. So you have international um, initiatives, impetus, then the regional level response, uh, as, as was also explained, and then the domestic one, and the other way around. So the innovation on the domestic level goes to the regional, and then again to the international. So we're see, see a, seeing a circular process of uh, for regulation. Uh, I think that's uh, that's that, that that is critical. And finally, and I come to, to the close now, I think it's extremely um, fortuitous that the IBA has taken this up because uh, this series wants to make, put books in the hands of, of, uh, of, of lawyers that actually make a difference uh, and that actually um, work on these real issues all the time. And um, I think that's the best uh, academic academics can hope for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Elizabeth. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for being in time, which is makes it rather easy for me. Um, we do have a number of questions. We do have a number of uh, logistics questions about when does the electronic version of the book becomes available and where can I buy the book in Nigeria and stuff like that. So I would ask, um, I don't know if now or in the end or before I, or, or while I go through the, through, through the actual questions to the panel, if Elizabeth could say something about those logistics ideas or uh, can you? Electronic version of the book, uh, distribution <laughs> of the book, something like that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so as today we are launching the, the the book. Actually, it is already. It is today. It is available from today. Uh, so that it was open for pre-orders, but from today it is. Um, it has. Uh, it is ready for for buying. And actually, there is a table of contents and the sample chapter. Um, uh, available from the website uh, as well. That it was sort of uh, uh, made available with the with the launch today as well. 
so uh, the link is the one that Professor Volker Robin uh, shared with uh, in the in the chat link. Okay. Thank you very much. And yes, Lisa. sorry, ah. uh, sorry, Manuel. And yes, and, and and so it can be sent anywhere. So uh, I, that's what I, I believe. So I uh, yes, be ready for for purchase. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a, we have five questions from. Thank you. We have five questions from the um, from mm -hmm. the the audience. Um, some of them go around what Jonathan, mainly Jonathan, has talked about mm -hmm. in also the book, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I'll read two of them. Uh -huh. And the Ruslu says, thank you to all speakers. At first, I just want to ask whether there is a worldwide regulational stream to make mining, petroleum, ENP firms invest or transform more in renewables. I see more news as Total or BP make some green investments, but are they just to compensate their damage to the nature, or is there a long-term necessity for big mine and petroleum firms taking into account the developments in electric cars and re renewables? I mean, if is is the logic of, comp of, of environment compensation by oil and gas and mining uh, companies just on a compensatory point of view, or are just or, are, or is it a business transformation? What do you think? Yeah, I think I can answer this. <laughs> um, I th the truth has always is somewhere in, in the middle, but definitely we are talking about a wide and general transformation of the oil and gas industry. Uh, the entire industry is refocusing, and it is normal. It is develop. It is development. Uh, oil and gas will not be here for. 100 more more year. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the the plan of the European Union is to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, all the car manufacturers in Europe are investing all of their uh, money only to the development of electric um, cars. Yeah, it's a pity, uh, I know. <laughs> yes, I, I have an electric car since three years. I recommend it to, to everyone, although I, uh, I also activate in the oil and gas industry. So yes, uh, it's, it's a business de decision which makes perfect sense. Uh, this is the future. Uh, gas will be part of the energy transition. So gas will be an important factor, at least for the next 30 years or so. Uh, oil will still be around. Uh, I see this trend that um, uh, oil is also um, uh, necessary for uh, for other in in industries such as uh, making um, plastic or uh, other materials. But the industry is transforming quickly, and all the major oil and gas companies know that, and absolutely everyone is investing in renewables or many others alternative. Um, uh, uh, alternative um, technologies su uh, such as uh, CCS uh, or uh, I even have clients who have started the project uh, on waste to energy. Thank you. Um, I have another question strictly directly directed to uh, Elizabeth, uh, which is to say that uh, traditionally mining law has been related to domestic legal system of each country to manage its resources and make investment possible in the mining sector. To what extent your research uh, shows that other players will have an active role in the management of resources and that how legal systems may address it? You do say that this is neglected and systematized and under theorized field. <laughs> Please, absolutely, absolutely. I think that uh, there is a role because uh, that's why I included governance and not only law. I, I believe that it's uh, because of the trends and, and what we can see the developments ongoing at the global stage. There is a role for for different actors uh, to to contribute to this global goal. Um, so everybody, we all have to learn to do things differently in a way, uh, little by little, to to, to contribute to this goal and actually uh, what we see it is uh, it, it has been ongoing but a, a trend that it is accelerating it is um, and it is very much in agenda 2030 is about 
partnerships, uh, partnerships between public uh, between public and private actors uh, to contribute uh, to uh, to global goals. And that is very much one of the a, 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 a development goal uh, in itself. So yes, uh, that is a, we, what we can see it is very, very active at the moment in different networks of factors. Uh, between in intergovernmental forums uh, at UN level, UN Environmental Assembly, uh, at the level of corporate strategies. Um, so this sort of really we can see speeding, speeding up of, of initiatives. Um, and what is, I think, at a very, very interesting uh, development is initiatives about, around the value chain, about collaboration, about the value chain, the Global Battery Alliance. We see these type of initiatives emerging that is very much about collaboration between different actors. And I think what is quite, uh, quite uh, recent in the mining sector for those of us who have been around in the sector for some time and and they have seen, they were familiar with the traditional players that were the mining companies. We see a whole host of new players. And so it is a, the very much the users of minerals that are also getting into, uh, into, uh, into partnerships and into business. So yes, it is a very dynamic field, I believe. And that is very much sort of an active role for, for all actors, yes. Someone is asking you as well, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. when and how you started to realize that this international perspective on minerals law is missing? And is it missing, mm -hmm. do I ask uh, everyone uh -huh. around mm -hmm. the panel, or should we uh -huh. have a more mm -hmm. polarized approach, more related to the circumstances of region or of country <laughs> and so on? Is it really missing? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I will answer first, probably for the, the so sort of later we can see different views on it. But um, so it is. Um, I, I believe that uh, well, there is not a global convention on mining and minerals, mm -hmm. and and and. When I realized that this is missing is because I've been, I had to teach, I teach the, the subject and it has usually been seen as a matter of domestic law. And so how to build uh, the understanding of the subject when you see all these different layers and levels of uh, legal and normative phenomenon. So in a way, so I had to build it for, for, the, for, for teaching, for the classes and from there, to build, a, I, I realized that there was a need of a framing uh, because it was insufficient to, to teach as well just from one perspective. I think as Anka said, so there is this interdependence between, between the national level, so the EU, EU law that it is bringing changes into national law in the case of, of Romania, so uh, uh, international commitments. So how you make sense of all this complexity when, when you teach the, the subject for teaching? And so so that, that from there it is that the framework emerged. So to, 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 to try to capture that complexity. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but Jonathan, I would be very interested about your question. So is it missing? <laughs> Jonathan, can I ask you the same question? And can I, and can I uh, relate it to another question, which is probably the last one, bearing in mind the time we have. Someone is asking as well, and I believe this would be also, you could also address this one. Has there been any examination of the potential for integrating the use of hydrogen power into mining operations? <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do, do we have four hours? Um, <laughs> that's what we'll need. Uh, uh, we'll there is for a, lunch, at least yeah, here exactly. where I am. <laughs> yeah. um, and look, I, I don't want to borrow. I don't want to borrow any time from uh, why we're all here, and that, of course, is uh, to focus on th this wonderful new book and Elizabeth's. Uh, insightful comments. So um, I, I think I would say this, uh, in respect of uh, new, uh, new, new markets and new processes uh, ultimately being adopted by the extractive industries, I think that's coming. I think there's a lot of pressure on the extractive industries uh, to change the manner in which they're, they're currently operating. I know in the oil and gas sectors internationally, there is uh, a lot of interest in biorefineries. There's a lot of interest in alternative fuels, uh, including renewable natural gas and hydrogen. Hydrogen today is not 
uh, economically viable in a lot of jurisdictions, but there's a great push to uh, to consider whether we'll see a blue, a green uh, hydrogen, perhaps uh, something through electrolysis, depending upon uh, the the local circumstances around uh, energy markets. Because of course, hydrogen isn't like anything else we talked about. There can't be a single strategy on hydrogen because, of course, it's based on the resources available and the social and social circumstances of the of the, the host country as well as the region. Um, but but I think there's a lot of things for the gas future as well, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, you know, I think I think that that's a the question is great because it, it brings us back to all of these interesting interplays that I think Elizabeth's been talking about. And so yeah. uh, with that, I think I'll pass it back to you. And do you have any comments? Any more comments from anyone? Elizabeth, would you like to say something, Professor Ro Professor Robin? Yeah, very, very, very briefly. I think this question is is one of the most interesting ones, and I could only say that you need to read Anna's book because um, she demonstrates, as no one else has done, uh, that there is a reality of internationalization of minerals. It's not complete, and it's never going to be. It's never going to push the national control out out of the window, and it cannot because this is a matter of sovereignty. But what she does show is, and that's the first time I think that has been done that there's other uh, principles now um, moving ahead and uh, it will uh, eventually move into all fields, including hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth, would you like to say something? Shall I hand it over to Carlos? I, I haven't dealt specifically with hydrogen. Um, yes. So, but it is uh, definitely, it is, yeah. So, uh, I, I wouldn't have uh, more comments than what it has been, it has been said. We'll break for lunch, definitely, <laughs> and go to go back to hydrogen. Well, uh, I think that we don't that don't have much time now. I would ask Carlos Viena, my good friend Carlos, uh, chair of the Mining Law Committee, and as I said, the former alumnus of the uh, of the, of Dundee. Um, to make the closing remarks in this in this webinar, Carlos, over to you. Thanks, Manuel. This this has been wonderful, a wonderful discussion. Although short, we should we should we could definitely go on for for much longer. Um, while you were all uh, speaking and discussing, it made me remember the early to mid twentieth uh, century uh, and uh, and the move. Uh, from international to national uh, control of resources, uh, resource-rich countries reacting to a more international uh, presence in the production and use of, of uh, natural resources, and and it may be th and and uh, and I think and I thought of that because when moving into a more international. Uh, uh, legal framework, standards, uh, regional or even intra-regional uh, discussions. One has to be very, I, I would use the word delicate, so as to not foster, uh, I think, the move back to nationalism, uh, to claims of sovereignty. Um, so that crossed my mind. Obviously, the world is different from the past. Uh, but those are issues I think, I haven't read uh, Elizabeth's book, but maybe she addresses some of these issues. Uh, and it made me think it's, it's all very interesting and, and we have to think all of that uh, through. But what I really wanted to say um, was that we had around 80, I think, uh, participants today, literally from all parts of the globe. So this is truly a hub. Uh, for uh, extractive industry discussion. Uh, the I, on behalf of the IBA, I'd like to say we're very happy to be here uh, to, in a small way, collaborate. Um, I also like to, to, to thank the, the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation, uh, obviously the Center uh, for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy of the University of Dundee. Thank you so much for the speakers. Thank you, Peter, Volker, Manuel, Anka, Jonathan, and especially Elizabeth. Congratulations on your new book. Um, thanks to all attendees. Uh, it's great to have you. We will certainly try to organize other dis interesting discussions. And also wish you all a happy holidays. 
uh, very good 2022, hopefully different from uh, 2021, I should say. I, 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 I guess uh, 2020 was sort of a lost year, so I'm, I'm, I'm leaping one year. But uh, all the best for 2021. Hopefully it'll be a bit different from 2020 and we'll be able to uh, do this in person perhaps sometime next year. Thanks everyone.